Okay, and we're just gonna give everybody a minute to filter into our room here. I like to imagine that we are all walking into the same room together and we're greeting each other and getting a really hot cup of coffee and kind of making our way and coming in to sit down. So we'll just, we'll pretend for a moment that we're all together uh, doing that and let folks um, filter in here and get started shortly. So for those of you joining us, um, please go ahead and keep in mind the Q&A function. We'll be using that for our question and answer period, but you're welcome to go ahead and start using that now. Uh, and let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody, I'm Jenna Ben Yehuda. I'm the President and CEO of the Truman Center for National Policy. And I'm really delighted um, to have with us today, Nancy Lindbergh, who is the CEO and President of the US Institute of Peace. Welcome Nancy, it's so great to see you. Great to be here, thanks Jenna. Uh, and welcome, Lois. Uh, Lois Quam is the President and CEO of Pathfinder International. Thanks so much for joining us, Lois. Oh, thank you very much, Jenna. Um, and we're really delighted to have both of these spectacular women joining us today uh, for a conversation that uh, we feel like needs to be had uh, to start thinking about the implications of COVID in the developing world and what it means for fragility. And so before we get underway, um, I will offer a shortened version um, of what are some very lengthy and impressive bios. Um, and we'll start with Nancy. Uh, Nancy has served as President and CEO of USIP since February 2015, created by Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan, federally funded institute to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. USIP links research, policy training, and direct action with partners in conflict-affected areas. Prior to joining USIP, Nancy served as the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, what we affectionately call DACHA at USAID. And from 2010 through 2014, uh, Nancy directed the efforts of more than 600 team members in nine offices focused on crisis prevention, response, recovery, and transition. She has also led response teams for some of the biggest challenges the world was facing at the time, including the crisis in Syria, droughts in the, in the Sahel and Northern uh, Horn of Africa, the Arab Spring, as well as the Ebola crisis where she was the lead for USAID. Nancy spent most of her career working on issues of transition, democracy, civil society, conflict, and humanitarian response. Prior to joining USAID, she was president of Mercy Corps, where she spent 14 years helping to grow the organization into a globally respected one known for its innovative programs in the most challenging environments. She has lived and worked in Nepal and Central Asia and was a founding member of the National Committee for North Korea and served as co-chair of the board of the US Global Leadership Coalition. She holds degrees from Stanford uh, and the uh, Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, and Lois uh, is, I mean, both of these women are just incredible. We could, we could just have a conversation about all of the wonderful things that both of you have done in the places you've traveled, but maybe we'll get to some of that. Uh, Lois Quam has been named three times to Fortune's list of the most influential women leaders in business. Uh, Lois joined Pathfinder in 2017 as its CEO. Before Pathfinder, Lois served as Chief Operating Officer of the Nature Conservancy, and as a senior advisor to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. She was selected by President Obama to head his signature global health initiative at the Department of State, which provided more than $8 billion annually to help solve major healthcare challenges facing millions of individuals across 80 countries. She reported directly to Secretary Clinton to advance a comprehensive strategy to increase US global health diplomacy created a $200 million public-private partnership, and introduced integrated systems approaches for global health programs. But prior to her work in public sector, Lois was the founder of and CEO of Ovations, which is a division of the Fortune 50 global corporation, United Health Group. She is a Rhodes Scholar and holds degrees from Oxford and McAllister College. And she's on faculty at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health in the Department of Public Health 
and policy. She speaks English and Norwegian. Uh, useful, perhaps, when you least expect it. Yes. Um, I suspect. Well, big and hearty welcome um, to both of you to Truman. What is our what is our space right now at Truman? Um, I really want to just jump right in, um, if we may. I, I really see this as a conversation amongst us, and then we'll we'll open up at around 1:30 for a conversation with our members uh, and other uh, welcomed guests. Uh, please do use the Q and A function. We will start queuing questions up in that fashion and really look forward to hearing from folks. We've got folks joining us from all over the world. Um, and so I'm hoping, Nancy, if we could start with you to help us set the stage a little bit. Um, when we talk about fragility um, in this context and thinking about the developing world, can you help define this space for us a little bit and, and share with us how you define fragility in the development context, what it means for governance, and then maybe if, because you were just so instrumental in the passage uh, of the Fragility Act, tell us what kind of framework uh, exists for us thinking about policy responses, and then maybe we can dig in and that'll help infuse um, how we think about these problems. Sure, um, thanks, Jenna. Um, and, you know, as you could tell from my history, um, you know, when you, when you work in crisis and a lot of years on the humanitarian end of things, you get to a point of saying, well, how do we get ahead of these crises? How do we not having to respond with humanitarian or military um, actions? And that really led me personally to this whole concept of a more preventive approach by understanding what were the characteristics of these places that led to continued breakdown, conflict, you know, inability to withstand the shocks of um, natural disasters and conflicts that become violent. And what, what has emerged over the past decade is a remarkable consensus across a lot of different um, development experts that when you have governments that are um, uh, not responsive to the needs of their people, when they are without the capacity to serve the needs of their people, and um, often characterized by uh, highly marginalized parts of their community, a lot of social um, fragmentation, um, that's, the, that's how you know that there's a higher likelihood that they will not be able to manage external shocks more effectively. Um, and so remarkably, uh, over the last year, this growing consensus has emerged into new policies within the United States government, within the World Bank, DFID, uh, uh, IMF is really grappling with this because we know that despite extraordinary gains uh, globally, that the fragile states where 1.8 billion people live continue to be that common denominator of extreme poverty, global, of violent extremism, of uh, the most vulnerable to natural disasters and pandemics, mm -hmm. um, most vulnerable to the predations of external factors. So they, they more likely experience um, internal conflict as violent. So it's, it's really understanding how do we better address that so that all of our development investments in health and agriculture and education uh, can, can be sustained and not overturned by conflict and natural disasters. Thanks so much for, for setting that, the stage for us here. And Lois, as we, as we think about this um, absorptive capacity for shock and concepts of resilience, um, as we start this conversation, can you paint for us a bit of a picture um, of global health capacity mm -hmm. and what that looks like on the health side in particular? Yes, uh, Jenna, building off of Nancy's remarks, um, when we think about global health capacity, what the United States does in terms of building global health capacity around the world um, not only benefits those people who are living in fragile states, it is also 
uh, one of the single most important ways to save American lives and the American ways of life. It's as significant as an investment as anything we do in the military or at the Pentagon. Global health capacity development and investment, having excellent global health systems, is a national security issue. And the pandemic has, we knew that, but the pandemic has demonstrated that. As the UN report that uh, was so timely uh, came out last fall, uh, co-chaired by former Norwegian Prime Minister Gru Harlem Brutlag, noted that a new disease can get around the world now in 36 hours because of travel and supply chains. So what the pandemic has showed us is that we are dependent on each other. We know what tools need to be developed in global health capacity development. It isn't one of these settings where we don't know what to do, but we need to do it. And the US should take the leadership in doing that in collaboration with other global bodies like the WHO. And so as we think about kind of what that architecture looks like, I mean, WHO certainly has faced a tremendous amount of criticism, not just from this crisis, but can you help us understand who some of these major actors are? And as we think, Nancy, I note back to your experience uh, on working Ebola, in terms of a global response, can, are, are, we, are we enough down the path where we can start thinking about how this compares to an Ebola? Is that a fair comparison of how the international community has or has not engaged? And, and maybe like, where is the World Health Organization in this? Um, were they built for this moment? Well, I'm happy to start and I know Lois will have views on this as well, but um, you know, it, what's not comparable is the scale of the crisis. I mean, the Ebola effort of 2014 that I was involved with um, was, really centered in those three West African nations. And uh, the world mobilized uh, in a significant way and in a, in a collaborative way. Uh, and that kept it from becoming a more global pandemic. And if you recall back to 2014, when the first case reached the shores of the United States and people went into utter panic, mm -hmm. there was an extraordinarily um, significant response. If you recall, our U.S. military was mobilized and um, the U.S., France, and China each took the lead in each one of those three countries, but assisted by countries all around the world. Um, WHO, and Lois knows much more about uh, WHO than I do, you know, at the time it was underpowered in terms of its ability to mount an emergency response. There was a new UN structure crafted specifically to address Ebola called the UNMIR. Um, but what it underscored, I think, is that we could use additional international structures and increased capacity to enable the kind of coordination that is so vital for these kinds of responses. And as a result, there was a lot more investment and focus on re-energizing the emergency unit of WHO. Um, but, you know, like all of these international organizations, there are almost always things that can be improved and can be made better. Yeah. And their needs absolutely in a time of these global challenges, we need the international systems that allow the kind of global cooperation that's essential, whether it's a pandemic or what we're seeing on the climate front. Um, you know, without which individual efforts won't add up to the same impact that we require. So this role of a, a convener, I mean, we don't have that. It doesn't feel that way. Um, certainly not as compared to Ebola. Um, I'm wondering, Lois, what, what you feel like, how is this starting to play out in health systems? Um, mm. Certainly, you know, if we look at some of the the heat maps of the spread, we've seen, I mean, obviously U.S. cases, um, you know, far exceeding that of other nations. We saw early spikes in Spain, Italy, China, obviously very early. Um, can you, I know you work extensively in Africa. Maybe if you could just speak to um, what is starting to happen and, and aligned against the health systems that you know so much about, what we might reasonably be able to expect in the next few months. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, the first thing is um, Americans won't be safe from this virus until everyone is safe from this virus globally. The um, easy spread of a disease like this, the connection patterns that we have in travel, in, in migration, in trade, means that there has to be a global response of disease con control and prevention around the coronavirus. There is no way to seal our borders effectively without that. So that's the first thing. And that's why it's really important that the US plays a leadership role on this as it does uh, the US government in other national security areas. And um, as Nancy said, obviously the WHO can be strengthened and should be strengthened. Um, um, I wanna just think, ask you to put your mind's eye for a, woman, for a moment in, um, in thinking about the way that women are on the front lines here. Um, and women are most of the community health workers in Africa, for example, and in other places in the world. 70% of all community health workers are women. But where women are really in the front lines is that women are almost in every case the family health care giver. Uh, the first warning of a pandemic is not an ambulance siren. It is not a. Um, it is not at the hospital door. It is somebody telling a woman, usually, almost always, a mother, a grandmother, or auntie, that they don't feel good. And that woman then makes all the crucial early decisions. Um, do they, are they referred in for treatment? Do they do anything in the household to prevent contagion? Um, do they do anything to determine who, who, this who their, their sick family member had contact with? And supporting women um, through um, giving women tools, digital and otherwise, to be able to make the best decisions possible in these situations, supporting women so that women who want to have access to contraception can have access to it and not have to endure unintended pregnancy during a pandemic. The, this is crucial. Women are the resilient innovators in every uh, situation of distress on behalf of their family and their communities. If we give them the tools that they need, they, women globally are a force in this pandemic, are a force in building global health capacity as an early warning system. So strengthening the WHO, the US government's leadership and in investing in particular in women is the way forward to have a safer world. I think you make such a, a critical, a critical point um, about how it does start at that family level right? Um, and those early decisions being key. Have you, we've heard so much, I feel like, about the disruption yeah. to the supply chain as relates to U.S. manufacturing capability and like, can I get my iPhone on time, uh, the trade impacts for the U.S. Are we seeing this in healthcare supply chains? In particular, for example, you mentioned contraceptives. Has, have you seen that disruption already take place? Oh, absolutely. Um, we see lack of contraceptive supplies get to countries. And that means that women who want to use contraception are not able to get access to it. We also see women dying in labor and delivery, women who could easily be saved. Mm -hmm. The front of the New York Times today has a very gripping story about an Indian woman who visited eight hospitals before she and her baby died. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a story off repeated. Um, so one of the challenges we're going to face uh, in addition to this epidemic is, is, is that loss of life, needless loss of life. And we also know that vaccine campaigns have been stalled either because of issues around supply or other factors. So mm -hmm. I would anticipate that we'll see a resurgence of, of you know, preventable and very contagious diseases like measles. You mean vaccine supply chains for non-COVID, right? Like measles, other yep. malaria, yep. and other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. so I appreciate, Lois, so much how you contextualize this within the national security framework. We here at Truman are really thinking expansively about um, what today's approach to national security mm -hmm. ought to be uh, mm -hmm. and what is a big part of that. And we certainly see fragility and global development as a, as a part of this. Nancy, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about 
how you've seen that play out in the Sahel um, and in the Horn of Africa and some of the things that, um, you know, your kind of spidey sense is tingling on as you look ahead the next several months and think about at places like Somalia, for example, um, in Ethiopia, um, what we might have concern around, um, not just for Al Qaeda, but there's obviously a lot of looming humanitarian uh, crises with relation to uh, food security and so on. I think that is like the more traditional national security mm -hmm. tie that people could make, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you see that. Well, let me look back before I look forward. And that is um, about a year and a half ago, U.S. Institute of Peace was asked by the Senate to convene a task force uh, of eminent persons to look at um, the cause of violent extremism in fragile states. And it was really prompted by the realization that 17 years after 9-11 and $6 trillion that uh, violent extremism had increased fourfold, particularly mm -hmm. the Middle East, the Horn, and the Sahel. And Congress was, said, you might want to take a different look at why we're not having this impact. And it was chaired actually by Governor Kane and Congressman Hamilton who co-chaired the 9-11 report. Um, and it, it, based, it, it was an exhaustive look with many, many experts feeding into this report, but the resulting recommendations were basically that we are fully invested as a nation in addressing the symptoms and going after violent extremism with our military capacity. We are missing the upstream issue. And going back to how I described fragile states, those characteristics enable an environment that is more conducive for recruitment um, when you have that also with the presence of violent ideologies. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very similar to the kind of prevention for fragility that relates to you know, vulnerability to pandemics and a whole host of, of shocks. Um, and as you mentioned at the top, Jenna, those recommendations uh, helped inform the passage of the Global Fragility Act that was passed with bicameral, bipartisan support in December. And it really provides a different framework for how we think about uh, development action. It, it's still a very new act. It was at very end of December. And the act says we want uh, state aid and DOD to collaborate on strategies, five pilot countries in September. So we have the urgent, I think, opportunity and, and necessity to really pull forward that framework and put it into place now. So in going to the looking forward, I mean, we at USIP are very focused right now on Ethiopia and Sudan, for example, which are two countries that are very much on this knife's edge transition with new leadership, um, exciting opportunities for them to be more open and more democratic, to throw off you know, decades of repressive leadership. But it will, take, it will take a concerted effort that development and diplomacy and security are all thinking in the same framework of how to help those countries move through the, the extraordinary pressures of the pandemic because um, in addition to what Lois was outlining, a lot of these countries in the Horn and in the Sahel are um, being affected not just from the health impacts, but from the economic impacts. And many, many more people are being pushed into poverty, into hunger. You've got the potential uh, uh, specter of famine in the Horn of Africa with the locusts and the droughts. I mean, it's... Mm layers and layers of challenges that these countries are absolutely not equipped to address without concerted international assistance, but international assistance that is not just providing the help, it's enabling um, the political systems to be more inclusive. If they end up doing really unequal kinds of help, if, if the governments um, exacerbate patterns of inequality and exclusion, that will, on the other side of all this, uh, lead to more problematic outcomes. So we have a real opportunity right now to think differently about development and how national security mm -hmm. 
a way of bringing together the development, the, the, the diplomacy, and the security for the common goal of a more resilient, more democratic, more mm. responsive to the needs of its people state. Mm. I'm sold. I'll, I'll sign up. <laughs> I'll sign up, Nancy. Um, you know, reflecting on my own years working in security, cooperation, and assistance in Latin America, I appreciate how culturally challenging it is to get these entities to work together. Um, and if we could just geek out for a second on thinking about how you, how do you do it? I don't, I mean, does the, does the act provide for some of this stuff? I mean, the, the NDAA from, was it 19, um, that revamped security assistance? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard stuff. Um, and moving people's money around is a surefire way to get people, uh, you know, to pay attention and get pretty defensive. I mean, on the interagency side, are we ready for that kind of cooperation or, or is this an opportunity um, down the road for a lot of innovation? I'm just thinking operationally, are our systems in place to your mind to be able to execute? You know, I think all of us are, you know, have scars from being inside the bureaucracy. Am I like projecting too much? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I, we, I'm sure we all have not just wonk, but pain that we, we could discuss. However, I, I, I think that um, there, has, there has been progress uh, with the Stabilization Assistance Review, if you want to get wonky, that state aid and DOD did over the last few years. Um, it, I, I think we're not there in terms of the right incentives uh, and in terms of the bigger thinking that needs to happen to enable uh, state aid and DOD to really work together in a more mm -hmm. productive way. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are, the cultures are still quite different. There's not equal levels of, of mutual respect for what are very distinct disciplines. Um, but when pursued with a common goal, um, one could imagine far, far greater outcomes uh, given the magnitude of the investment and the strength of the capabilities that we bring. Instead, we end up undercutting mm -hmm. just yep. a massive investment. Um, but it will take, I think you have to do it at the point where an administration is changing because the minute people are in their seats yeah. and they have to protect the equities and the teams that are there, as opposed to, you know, we, hmm. the, the merging of food for peace and office of foreign disaster assistance was about eight years in the making and it's still very, very early days, but it, it, it came to, it came about because people realized that the more that you move to cash assistance, the, the more you don't need so many different entities. And I think that's right. true the entire UN human system. Um, one could go on. We're not there yet. We're get, we're, you know, it's incremental progress, but maybe there's enough of a disruption moment right mm -hmm. now that one could really begin to move things around in a more meaningful way. Yeah, I, if I can jump in here, Jenna, sure. I sure hope so. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that really, um, you know, I found uh, disappointing when I was in government was this lack of appreciation for what different parts of the US government and global health brought. And I remember sitting down with people and saying, there are different ways to look at the same challenge. And US, mm -hmm. USAID has this beautiful way of seeing how all the different pieces relate to each other. Healthcare relates to girls' education, relates to the child marriage age. And that holistic intersectional view is really important. CDC has this sort of epidemiologic, you know, go for the line of infection and find out what to do. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point of view and state the diplomacy that looks at you, the, your interests and our interests and how do we, you know, that's important. Then you've got the NIH and the Peace Corps. And in some other settings I've worked in, that different point of view is recognized as an engine of innovation, mm. that you're likely to get to a better, more sustainable, durable uh, response. And it, it didn't come off that way um, yeah. in my experience uh, in the bureaucracy. <laughs> And and let's 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 this let's this disruption should should 
should do that because, you know, this pandemic has showed up our weaknesses in a pretty mm -hmm. clear way and we need new approaches to respond to it. So those different yeah. points of view, I think, can help get us there. Reimagining this interagency process, make it, yeah. make it hurt a little less for all of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think it's because it does, um, it does drive outcomes. It does. It does. And it's a huge distraction. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's an excellent point. Uh, so just a reminder for folks, we welcome you to provide questions using the Q&A function. Um, we're going to take this opportunity now and turn to a Truman member, Erica Castor, um, who works in this space. And thanks so much for joining us, Erica, to, um, to offer some reflections based on your own extensive work in this field. Thank you for inviting me. Everything you guys have said in the last 30 minutes has given me so many things, that, so many ideas that, that I'd like to respond to, but I think probably the most useful thing um, that I can do is kind of raise some of the questions that are in my head. Um, but I, I actually, actually I, I first will, will just comment on the interagency bit because I think that's the thing that's closest to my heart. Um, Nancy knows that I think I left USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives in 2014, and I left there with a mission to do an after action review of the US government, the State Department's, um, the State Department led interagency response to the complex crisis in Libya during the revolution, which obviously is not a pandemic, but still the, the structures, looking at the structures and processes that are in place there or not in place there and, and kind of the learning that has been done or needs to be done um, by people in different positions. And, and I think, you know, unfortunately I agree with Nancy that there's still, a, you put it very nicely, there's a lot to do, I think, in, in terms of improving interagency coordination in response to complex crisis, crises and, and probably beyond that. I, at the, I did a, I did a project 2016-17 um, looking at positive lessons learned from interagency coordination um, at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And what we came out with were a lot of one-off innovations that have been made in response to different types of crises. Some of them uh, often, I should say, sometimes anyway, uh, you know, intersecting with the with the health sector, usually in a way of how can we help, how can we work with with the health sector to stabilize a kind of much bigger picture crisis. Um, and you had people at the working level innovating over here. You had an ambassador innovating over there in different parts of the world. And but you know we, we haven't really seen is that the, the initiatives that they took repeated very frequently. And so we're still gathering lessons learned, but not reading them very frequently. Looking back and, and reading them and taking stock. So you know, to me that uh, that is one of the you're kind of getting it down to brass tacks. The difficulties that's going that are going to face the U.S. government in terms of really activating um, the Fragility Act and um, activating the COVID response, um, particularly, I, I would say, from my perspective, uh, there is a lot of discussion and a lot of work that goes into improving coordination at the, at the senior leadership level. Um, but there is not as much uh, effort or resources that go into improving working level coordination with, you know, at least in government, maybe say like, GS-13 to GS-15 folks who are sometimes just handed, you know, a, a crisis and maybe they just came off a relatively calm uh, desk working on some other, on, on some other country. Um, and, you know, this is, this is totally being thrown into the deep end and they haven't been shown how or who needs to be drawn into the process. And on, the, on in terms of integrating, um, I think that, that COVID, and, and I imagine, I was not involved in the Ebola uh, response, but I imagine that um, that offered kind of a same um, opportunity and necessity to, to kind of integrate uh, healthcare workers and healthcare, uh, public health officials into, uh, into a broader picture of response than, than maybe is, is very common to people. I, you know, I've worked on my over 2006 to 2014, I was almost exclusively working in fragile countries and on um, political transitions and stabilization. I don't think I can count more than five times that I interacted with a public health official or a global health uh, expert during that time. You know, I, I did when it was serving purposes, I think, to forward stability in an area of interest. 
But I think at this point, we also need to be looking, and I, seen, I haven't seen so much written on this and kind of the reams and reams of, of publications that have come out yet since the COVID crisis about how this is going to affect the globe, but I haven't seen much about uh, how are we going to actually, rather, rather than seeing um, stability and fragility as a cross-cutting issue that, needs to be, that could be considered as an objective for, for health and food security and, um, and, uh, and support to um, economic assistance and stuff, how, we're going to need, a health, we're gonna need a, a health expert at our side at all times to make sure that what we're doing in our normal kind of normal pattern of work is not creating problems um, that we don't foresee because we don't understand how health systems work and how and how pandemics work and stuff like that. So it, it, it cuts both ways. And I think I probably am up on, on my time, but my, you know, my questions would be, you know, where would you guys start or the audience in terms of um, improving that, that integration and, and um, hand-holding at the working level, kind of, between people from different contexts. Mm. Do we need, like, a, a health liaison officer at the country team level, yeah. for example? How do you... I, I would say almost certainly yes, you know, but, but what, where else? Yeah. You know, and in agencies that are, don't, don't work as closely together as state and aid do, usually we have, we have enough of our own problems just with state and aid, but, I mean, when you start trying to touch the defense sector and stuff, that's very difficult. Thank you so much, Erica. We appreciate all of your work, um, and we're so glad that you could join us. Nancy Lois, would you like to respond to that? Nancy, you want to go first? Okay, well, Erica, it's great to see you. Um, and um, I will echo the fact that, you, you know, decades into uh, doing this kind of work, when Ebola hit, it was the first time I had really come face-to-face -face with a lot of the health capacities within our government. I mean, that's truly a, colli a collision in some respects between those who worked crises and those who worked health issues. And there was a lack of, of knowledge, even of, you know, who set, who, what, who did what, what were the approaches, what were the, you know, so part of it is fostering greater familiarity and, and mutual respect. But, um, you know, we have struggled forever on this coordinate, is it coordination, is it integration? You know, how do you not overly politicize your development and humanitarian work? And where I have come down on all of that, very important conversation is that it's really about alignment. And I think you touched on it, Eric. It's about having a shared consciousness of, of what is it that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, and, you know, we often get tripped up because of the very different tempos and the different timelines mm -hmm. for the actions that different parts of our government are undertaking. But what I'm hopeful with the Global Fragility Act is that by requiring these, these strategies to be jointly developed across the interagency, it will move, I won't say it'll solve, but it will move forward this understanding that when you have all of these characteristics of fragility, that you are mo more likely to have, you know, violence and uh, a reverse in your development gains. And so it's in everybody's interest to, to, to look at those core drivers of fragility. Um, and that there are a lot of other pieces that plug in, you know, into that hub of, of a more responsive, more inclusive, more accountable government uh, that can sustain your development investments, including your, your um, uh, global health security investments. So that's, the, you know, that's on the horizon. This is, well, we're coming up on September. I think all of us should be looking with great interest um, and asking for how are those strategies coming along? Let's, let's look, let's see. And I know there are people across the interagency who are, I mean, as we all know, they're hugely uh, experienced and dedicated professionals who want this stuff to work and they get in the systems that kind of chew people up but despite that people do amazing work well i i want to echo um what uh, erica you shared and nancy and i think the coronavirus is going to really change things in how we work and i'll just touch on two areas 
Um, the first is around urgency. A easily spread respiratory disease mm -hmm. creates, a, creates a global health challenge that is immediately an American challenge. And it's not easy to deal with. Now, that's been there before. I remember when I worked at State talking to the Secretary of Health for the state of Virginia, and she said one of her really most difficult things was when an unvaccinated child with measles passed through Dulles Airport, and they had to try to do the contract tracing for everyone, but there's pretty high measles herd immunity in the U.S. Um, now we see that what happens when there's a contagious respiratory disease that there isn't. So I think that the domestic call for global health capacity development is gonna be different than what we've faced in other areas. The second thing, and I really have learned this being at Pathfinder, is at Pathfinder, uh, my colleagues are overwhelmingly from the countries where they work. They understand the history and culture and language of the communities that we work in because it's their history, culture, and language. So we didn't evacuate people when the pandemic occurred, and therefore we've been able to continue to provide services, integrating reproductive health services with the response to the pandemic. And I think that that local leadership, the inability to sort of fly yeah. people in, there's a lot of positives to that. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's I, I just really believe in the model that we have and I've really seen it be so relevant and empowering. Uh, and so supporting local organizations, uh, local leaders mm -hmm. who are there and going to be there, I think is gonna become much, much more um, the way of the future. Yeah, I think you, you make a great point and maybe it's an opportunity for our country teams to rethink their models for locally employed staff um, and how it could contribute to broader resilience um, for the team operationally. We have a lot of questions um, and a very eager audience. So I'd like to transition to that um, and to start, um, Mary Beth Goodman offers, I think, an important question here. And she says, Nancy, uh, what is the likelihood that the Fragility Act will be funded? It was passed as an authorization. It doesn't have an appropriation, which might be likely to continue given all of the domestic COVID spending, um, what do you think the outlook is for a, an appropriation for the act? Well, hello, Mary Beth. Hope you're doing well. Um, there was, uh, upon, in, this, in the 2020 budget, there was some, fund, uh, some funding associated with the Global Fragility Act, not a lot, um, but there was for each of the five pilot countries. What 21 looks like, I think, um, you know, it's going to require everybody reminding the appropriators that this is an opportunity to seize. And, you know, it's a, it's a tricky budget season for all the reasons we know. It's an election year. People um, are competing. There's a lot of competing priorities. But I, I do think that just reminding legislators that this is a vehicle to use uh, increases the likelihood that there would be some dedicated funding in, in the 21 budget. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Yogi, I'm sorry, Yodi Alakija. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, former Chief Humanitarian Coordinator for Nigeria. Um, mm -hmm. Having been at the helm of one of the world's uh, worst humanitarian crises as a woman, this topic really resonates with me. And as a public health professional and infectious disease expert, the impact of COVID on already fragile states in Africa will be just devastating. How do we put together the correct international structure that is fit for this purpose and really centers women uh, at the heart of a response effort? Lois, I'm wondering, given your experience on this, whether you have thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you so much for your leadership globally in Nigeria. Uh, and, um, you know, it's very difficult. Um, the, um, the WHO has a key role to play. Um, the, um, a number of countries have um, stepped out with very strong responses. Um, but there isn't a unified uh, response globally. And that means that it leaves not only countries, but organizations and, 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 and communities scrambling. Um, I think that there is an opportunity for a new leadership coalition to come together around this. 
And I believe that the opportunity to invest in the ground, on the ground around women, around um, uh, ensuring uh, products for hand washing and mask wearing and um, are really central to develop the cap support the capacities and ministries of health and their um, satellites across countries. Uh, but the reality is, is really going to it's really up to every one of us. So what we've done at Pathfinder is with our leaders, you know, sought to retool kind of almost overnight in terms of the way that we provide these services. And I think um, the reality is that it, it, it requires that kind of uh, on the ground response that right now isn't well integrated. Thank you for that. Um, Roseanne Casey says, Power Africa offers good examples of interagency coordination, far from perfect, but generally positive on the interagency side. Uh, and it was set up with this as a design element. I don't know if we have a, any experience on Power Africa or reflections there, or maybe the broader question is, are there models um, for good coordination and development responses uh, and for humanitarian crises that we might apply in this context? Are there, and we know what hasn't worked, but are there success stories we ought to look to as examples here? There, there are, I think, a variety of, of success is maybe too strong of a word, but of, of uh, examples where things have turned out better. Um, and I, I would say it's often, I'll pick up on what Lois, Lois said, um, a huge um, indicator is, is uh, local leadership and mm -hmm. local leadership at the government level, at the community level, um, and an inclusive approach that allows the engagement by you know, U.S. You know, state aid and DOD to, to have um, far greater chances of succeeding and succeeding in those sort of core systemic ways. Um, and there are some good, there's some really great examples where, um, you know, people have, are, have held their governments accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, 2019 was the year of people power. And we saw where people are saying to their governments, enough, you know, we are done with corruption and authoritarian, authoritarianism. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of energy that uh, is so important to support. And unfortunately, COVID is threatening a lot of those gains. Protesters are less able to be on the streets. And we're seeing that under the cover of a global health response that a lot of countries are, are starting to, you know, backslide democratically. Elections canceled and, and uh, postponed. Um, so, I mean, this is where all these things interlock, right? The, the health issues with the dem democracy issues, with security issues. Um, and that's why we need to be careful not to lock in these more repressive approaches mm -hmm. under cover of ensuring a better health, health outcome. Um, that we need to understand if we do that, the downstream repercussions will not be good, nor in our interest. I think it's, it's such an important point um, as we think about what it means. I mean, often these moments provide permission structures for authoritarian regimes to continue um, their existing uh, plans. We certainly saw this in Hungary, right? And it's we're starting to see it uh, more and more. Um, to your point on the domestic angle, Jesse Bernstein offers an interesting question. He says, how does recent police brutality here at home impinge on U.S. global efforts to address uh, fragility, particularly around security assistance and um, thinking, of course, about our own policing efforts around the world. We saw, I believe it was the Norwegian government uh, or the Swedes restricting security assistance back to the United States for non-lethal equipment. Um, and certainly in terms we've seen of how uh, folks have organized here on the streets, even in, in light of uh, obviously very considerable health risks. Um, would love your thoughts both on the uh, what does it say about us and how we operate around the world and then also Nancy to your comments on the role of civil society. Well I'm happy to start and pass it to you Lois. I mean sure. you know th these have been unbelievably 
you know, sobering and humbling weeks uh, for all of us in the United States as we, you know, grapple with these mm -hmm. deep, deep wells of racial injustice. And um, I, I think there is a lot of soul searching about how do we promote these core values uh, that are so evidently not at play in our own system mm -hmm. um, that were baked in from 400 years of inequality. Um, and there have been some wonderful pieces written about the importance of addressing it and, and conf you know, confronting uh, these inequities and, the, and you know, really supporting the Black Lives Matter approach as you know, if we hope to pursue the kind of foreign policy that we have for these years, you know, that, those, that there's an inextricable uh, connection between the two that we've got, you know, we've, we've got to be responsible for what's happening in our own homes um uh as just a as a foundational bedrock i mean not only is it obviously critical we have to do it uh but it does affect the ability to project uh what we've always said are the animating values of our foreign policy yeah it's um you know this is a really a, a moment for this country and for all of us who are americans to see what we need to see and have the conversations that haven't occurred and then and then to act and i think if if we don't do that it's going to be very hard for us to play a leadership role in the world uh because we just won't have the credibility uh to do that and uh, one of my colleagues wrote to me this weekend about the protests in front of the u.s embassy in nairobi and it's a you know it's very much a this is a this is a very much recognized globally and um uh it is it is something that we as individuals and as in each of our organizations just just have to take uh and make this a transformative moment I, you know i would just add to that that th there is a national conversation that's been started and I think what we all, how we all react and what one does in this, in, in this period, um, you know, hopefully can serve as a model for other countries around mm -hmm. the world as well with very different circumstances. But, um, you know, even, even you know, illuminate some positive ways to address this kind of deep injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, let's see here. Shellberg, uh, a an, an friendly name um, that we know here, uh, offers, even with established infrastructure and organization, refugees and IDPs are particularly vulnerable. So how can we effectively assist informal populations, uh, particularly around economic recovery in urban slums. Um, mm -hmm. He's thinking, for example, of the Kibera slums in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. um, what does recovery look like, especially, I think Shell makes this important point about this, um, the informal economic sector, which is the driver in so many of these mm -hmm. places? It's a huge challenge. I think um, we found in in other situations like um, the response around HIV that it is it's a huge challenge, and many people suffer because they lose their livelihood, and systems aren't in place. Um, and it's also um, really necessary to have early warning systems in place to understand. Uh, when the epidemic is occurring and, and to be able to get help and move in early. And I think that's where investing in women who in those communities are mm -hmm. resilient innovators. You know, they are scrambling to do the best for their family. They, they are giving birth in whatever the circumstances are around them. To, if we can support them with access to family planning when they want it and other kinds of tools, they can be the engine of the response to the epidemic. And then I think within that are so empowered to play broader roles in their community. I think a really important reminder about the power of investing in women. I think it was Hillary Clinton was fond of saying that it's the single greatest investment that you can make, that, that women will stretch your dollar, dollar far and wide. Well, I, I'm cognizant of the time and we're coming upon um, the close of our hour here, though I know we could um, talk for far, far longer. Um, 
surely there are bright spots as you look around. Uh, and, I, and I wonder if we could end on a positive note and ask for your reflections on uh, where you see promise in this moment of peril um, and what openings might exist for us to rethink some of these systems that just haven't worked for us. Well, I think that, you know, in the urgency around the pandemic, you've seen a lot of uh, innovation and people reacting within 24 hours. We've also learned that we can act quickly to help each other and to save each other's lives um, in response to something that has, that, that has come up very suddenly and, then, and that we should be able to use in other settings. Um, so I think that there is, you know, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to build on these things. And then if we can create the kind of capacity that we're called for, that taking all these individuals acts of bravery and courage and innovation and, and sum it up in a way, we will build a, a system that prevents a lot of, uh, a lot of harm from occurring. So I would strongly echo that. I mean, the, the, creative, courageous acts that we've seen at the community level in very tough environments, you know, in Khartoum, in mm -hmm. Somalia, are mm -hmm. really, really inspiring. And so all the ways that that uh, community, broadly speaking, can continue to be supported. Um, and then, you know, it's always bottom up and top down, right? So a bright spot that, uh, I don't know if you all saw this, but there, there has been a lot of reflection that the countries that have recovered the fastest are all led by women. New Zealand, Finland, uh, is it? Um, Norway, yeah. Germany, yeah. right. And the observation was that, you know, it's not the fact only that they were women, but those uh, societies were almost all more account, more tolerant and more inclusive. And what they found in the leadership style of, of those countries with those women leaders is that there were more voices at the table. So you had more points of view re represented that gave you a broader understanding of the policy choices and what's necessary. And so it enabled a, a more thorough Mm -hmm. response that was based on more information instead of a single point of view that held that leader hostage. So if there's never been a more full-throated uh, recommendation, not just for women's leadership, but for the kind of societies that enable mm -hmm. uh, women or, you know, people of color, minority group in that country to serve in a leadership role uh, as a sign of real resilience. I found that to be an extremely hopeful note. Well, I, I think you offer both of you important points and we're really grateful to both of you here today for offering some pretty outstanding uh, examples of women's leadership uh, in particular. And uh, I don't know about our, our attendees here today, but I certainly feel better for knowing that, uh, that Lois and Nancy are on the case. Uh, and we really appreciate all of your hard work and your expertise. Um, and Erica, thank you so much for joining us from Germany. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you being here with us today for this important conversation. Well, thank you, Jenna. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Jenna. Nice to see you, Erica. Take yeah, care, everybody. Nice to meet you, Lois. Bye.